This is the Fitzy and Whipper with Kate Ritchie podcast. Well, do you know what? We have a beautiful person in here, not just physically, you, but also spiritually as well. And oh. the Imperfects podcast, sixth season. Wow, this is it's back again. You can get it wherever you get your good podcast from. We love this man, you Van Collibert. Welcome, welcome, buddy. It's so nice to see you. Can I just clear up something quickly with you? I heard on one of the podcasts somebody calling you Hugh Van Seilenberg. <laughs> Is that correct? I have been called so many things. Cycling bird one day. Oh, that's not bad. <laughs> yeah, that's cycling good. bird. I like that. There's an interview on the ABC and then I, a friend of mine sent me, found a picture on Google Images of a bird riding a bike. And <laughs> that bit. Anyway. Mate, let's talk about Resilience Project because one of the key topics which came up and we were discussing this off air was addiction to mobile phones. So in the hotel this morning where I was, I went down for breakfast and there was a family of uh, four. Yeah. So it was a mum and dad. It was a boy would have been I maybe 13, girl looked about 15, 16. And I was chatting to the dad at the buffet area mm. and he was saying um, they'd come down from Cairns for that stayed for two nights. And and I, he was sitting near me and I went. He, he went back to his table and he sat there. And his two kids were slumped in their chairs on their phones. Mum was on the phone. And I sort of, I was watching going, that's so sad. Like if that was us back in the day, you would be just so, you'd so excited with your family, trip to the city yeah, and chatting about it. About. And the guy, after about two minutes, he said, is there any danger I could have some conversation with someone in my own family? Mm. And he looked so upset about it. And no one answered. Like no one looked up from their phone. Oh. Like it was just met with complete silence. And he was sitting there eating his music, looking so shattered. And I was like, oh, that's really depressing. And then 10 minutes later, I realized all I'd been doing myself for the last 10 minutes of being on my phone yeah. as well. And so I, I have talked about this so much over the last five to 10 years, addiction to devices. And I've realized that, so in my book that I wrote, which is called The Far Too Personal Trainer. <laughs> oh, no, sorry. No, sorry. That's the book I wish I wrote. That's sorry. That's a, so, no, still a couple of copies available. Yeah. Far Too Personal Trainer. <laughs> dot com. How did you know JLo's heard about it? It's unbelievable. Jo- has yeah. she? Yeah, she has. Oh, yeah. my God. That is great. She, she can't believe it. She, <laughs> she loves can't it. can't believe it. Yeah, she didn't I, like I, it. She, no, she, <laughs> but she hasn't read it yet, but she's heard uh, about it. She's um, aware of it. So in my book, I did a whole section. I wrote it in 2019, and it was all, and I did this whole thing on addiction to devices. And I was all. I had four strategies in there, and I won't list them all now. But because I've realised that they worked back then, but they don't now. I feel like the big tech and the algorithms have got smarter and smarter and smarter, yep. and they've got better at making mm-hmm. us addicted. Yep. And we just and so they don't really. And there's only one out of the like. There was stuff like I was saying back in 2019. Oh, um, put your put all your social media apps in a folder and put it five screens across, and yep. and and label that like folder regret or something like that because yep. you know you're going to regret. Apparently, the most common emotion anyone experiences after ten minutes or more on social media is regret. So I was like, yep. you, you could name that Jeez. folder regret, and you could put it five screens across. I've realised for the last three years, I just swipe five screens, click on regret, don't even read it, and I just go straight into Instagram mm-hmm. and I'm stuck. Yeah. And so. I've sort of realised that it's the, the strategies I wrote about in the book. Um, they're, they're, they're because of the way technology has it's just got smarter and smarter. The algorithm's too good. It just keeps sending me videos of Brett Lee bowling <laughs> Yorkers and snakes being taken out of people's houses. Awesome. Which I cannot. I cannot. <laughs> I can't enough. say no to that. Yeah, yeah, no. I cannot not look at that. <laughs> so, Papa. And so I've I've in the last literally in the last three weeks I've taken a new step, and it's the only thing that really works for me. And I'd love people to try this. It's a technique and it involves literally putting your phone in a really inconvenient place where you actually can't physically get to it. So when I get home from work at five o'clock or five-ish, I leave it in the car Mm -hmm. and I park about 50 metres down the road. Wow. And then I go, but otherwise- Do you really do this? Well, yeah, in, yeah. In, yeah, like in the last three weeks yeah, I have. And it's been great. huge because I've noticed, I reckon if you think about it, the reason we go to our phone, so often the reason we go to our phone is actually just to numb a negative emotion. Well, convenience yep. and also we try to numb a negative emotion. So the second we feel sad, lonely, disconnected, um, whatever it is, we just grab mm-hmm. our phone and we try to numb the negative emotion. It works. It numbs the negative emotion. But it doesn't, it doesn't fix the problem. So we put the phone down. We're still where we were before. So the example I'll give is my daughter, who's four, has the last six months is having a lot of problems around bedtime. Her meltdowns honestly will last about an hour, I reckon. Yeah. And so, and it's my job to put her to bed. Penny's with the uh, with the boys. 
and I have had my phone on me. Whenever she's melting down, I just get my phone out and sort of look at snakes being taken out of people's houses or yeah. Brentlow's in Swinging Yorkers. Mm. And it's just like, I just, I've been doing that just because it's a negative emotion. I'm so upset with how she's going that I'm just grabbing my phone. And then I was like, no, what am I doing? Like, she's just watching me be on my phone this whole hour when she's in distress. And so I put it downstairs. But then after 10 minutes, I was like, I'll just go and get it. And I'd go, I'd, I was almost like I'd sleepwalking. I didn't even know I was yeah. doing I was going downstairs, mm. getting my phone. Now I've left it in the car. It's too far. I was like, I can't be bothered. And I've actually noticed that we get through the hour together. Like we both get upset together. Then we both cheer up together and we go through all the emotions together. We go through this sort of cycle. This We sort of complete this stress cycle together. And it's been really beautiful to really totally be present with her as she struggles and then works her way through it. Yeah. And I think is she, too- is she going to sleep? Is it, has it, it helped takes, in that sense? I, no, it, it still takes about an hour and a half for her to fall asleep. <laughs> yeah. um, but I'm lying there with her and I'm present for it. And when yes. she's struggling, the message she's getting is, hey, I'm here with you. Uh, you know, we're in this together as opposed to, oh, look at that delivery from Brett Lee. There's no yeah. way that's like... Great delivery. I was driving the other day in my car and I was in an area where, where, sort of where I grew up and I was feeling quite nostalgic driving around all the streets I grew up in. And I was reflecting back on really happy memories from when I was a kid. Do you know one of the happiest memories I've got is every day after school, I would, it was a 10-minute walk from school to the tram stop, 20 minutes on the tram, and then about 15 minutes from the tram stop to my house walking. Yeah. All up, it was pretty much about an hour. And... I, I just like what did we used to do we would just sit there and look out the window and stuff and then we yeah. would walk looking at things and we were just alone with our thoughts and I reckon it was we, we, we I think I loved sort of processing the day and just thinking about all the stuff that took place and reconciling my brain and confirming all the stuff that I sort of went through during the day and just having that time to myself before I got home I think was really nice mm. kids don't well no one gets that anymore that time of just doing nothing just no. walking around and sort of taking for the brain to develop yeah. yeah and so I think that's I, I just I mean, I know all the adults listening will feel very grateful they grew up without devices, but I just know, um, I just feel so sorry for kids who, from the age of, I mean, that's the other thing. I mean, when, 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 like, I mean, when do you give when, your kids a device? They're all well, asking. You know for what, it. Hugh? What's important was there was a uh, there's a push at the moment in the state of Florida to ban social media for kids uh, under 16. Oh my god! Now gosh. that would be an absolute heaven, wouldn't it? It would be incredible. I think most, I think most social medias these days, except because they you can't go on too young. I think the the age is really 13. Mm. But you know, those key developing years from 13 to 16, that three year period is just so crucial. You know, as a young teenager, for you to experience the right things and have your mind in the best place possible. Yeah, so we had a guy on that. We had a guy, it's a great point. We had a guy called Adam Grant on our podcast. Well, it hasn't come out yet. It'll be out soon. We interviewed him the other day and he talked about research that's just come out that basically shows the younger a person is when they get a device, the more likely they are to develop anxiety and depression, basically. Mm. This is such a strong link. And so, I wouldn't, I mean, we, we know how dangerous it is. We know how unhelpful it is for kids to be on these devices. I, I just feel like there should be a rule. It's a no-brainer, isn't it? We, we just... I, I, mate, well, it's me, not policed necessarily, no, is it? very hard to police. Yeah very, yeah. yeah, very very hard to police. And I think that even when people listening to something like this, they're kind of thinking, yeah, okay, it's all very well and good to say, oh, you're not allowed devices. But when I attempt to try and get my phone or the iPad off the child at home, yeah. they, ha- they are a screaming nightmare, which mm. is, also shows the level of addiction mm. to these devices. Totally. When you try and remove the thing that they're addicted to, so how do we um, implement the change? Because well, it's never yeah. too late. So how do you kind of? Because I look I, just personally, when we don't have, we have device-free weekends or weeks, or we just don't take them away with us. My daughter is a um, yes. a, a better person. No, yeah. she's a. Oh, we have a. Right, okay. we, well, do you know? No, it, <laughs> yes. It, I mean, it's very yeah. hard to get there. I agree. But I think the less you have it, the 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 better oh, like, yeah. the experience is that everyone has as a family. But how do you convince yeah, do a you parent start? who's using it as maybe a bit of a babysitter and a timeout thing to get to that point? I spoke to a community in country uh, New South Wales about a year ago, I think it was, and a lady had so one of the ladies in the audience, she, her job is she works with recovering addicts, so um, heroin addicts, and she said that when she takes a device, her device, her kid's device off her 15 year old girl, she said. Her response is very similar to when you deprive, you know, an addict from heroin. Wow. She, said it's, she said it's so frightening to see. Um, I, I and the other issue, and I'll get to that in a second, Kate. The other issue is, I think for a lot of parents are listening, going, "Yeah, but if I don't give my kid a device, then they're they're missing out. You know, they've been left out in all the conversations mm. that are taking place because 
and and they feel and that's really true so a lot of parents yeah. are saying i don't want my kids to have a device but i also i don't want them to feel like they're missing out and they're left it's out management isn't so it? yeah i feel like it's it's not on the individual right now i feel like there needs to be policy i feel like we need to have big change sort of at a much higher level than just household saying don't have your phone i feel like it should be I, I, sure, I feel like Apple or whoever, Samsung, surely there's a device out there mm-hmm. where it's got text messages, it's got phone, and that's pretty much and it. That's sure, it. Surely they could come up with that. It shouldn't be that hard. Yep. And that's what kids have till they're 16, I reckon. Well, honestly, yep. 18 would be, it'd be like driving to me. It should In be a perfect years. world, yeah. Yeah. And then you can go berserk when you're 18, do whatever you want to do. But I think for their brain, to protect their brains from the avalanche of information that's coming in. Yeah, and the stats that we have on mental illness and load and, you know, like, as you said, anxiety. Yeah. The, the earlier you get these things, I mean, we can't really ignore it. Yeah. So I haven't answered your question at all, Kate. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, you yeah. haven't. <laughs> uh, well, that's, that's, know, that's honestly, what happens every day. No, but, <laughs> but, but I, honestly, I honestly don't know. I don't know what to say to parents right now whose kids are addicted to devices. To, I, I don't but know. Don't you think you need to then treat it like every other addiction? You're talking yes. about this woman who said sometimes when you, I take the device off my child, it's like an addict withdrawing from something else that they're using in their life. So you've got to knuckle, you've got to kind of white knuckle it and take the device, implement strict rules and just stick to it and know that eventually you will come out the other side mm, better yep. for it. You, your house, your child, you know, you can't get rid of it altogether. Like you said, it's too, it's such a big part of them feeling mm. included within their, you know, friendship groups. But I, I think you just got to... Got to start somewhere. It's so much better. Totally. We only do it oh. on the weekends. Banned now. It's banned during the really? week. Yeah. So any gaming consoles or iPads, that's weekend only. Nice. Mm. We but do an see, hour on a Tuesday. But then it gets dangerous because you get to the weekend, all they want to do is do that. Yeah. And then you go, no, 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 we're not doing that. We're well, it's, it's also... My, my youngest son at the moment has a real passion for gaming. So it, he loves sitting there and talking to mates while yeah. playing a game. And loves it, yeah. and I understand that. Um, but we give him we give him time limits, and this is the thing he has. The, the hardest thing is for him to say goodbye to his mates and, mm. and stop it all together. But I think the most the, the most important question you out of all of this is how does Brett Lee hold the ball to get that into <laughs> <and laughs> walk your car? I just knew but, that was Brett Lee related. I just knew. Oh, it. No, and you just knew the whole time. I don't know you? how he does it, Hugh. It's no so one does. beautiful. If you yeah. want to have a good time on YouTube, just type in Brett Lee and. Swing your cat and yeah, it's good. Actually, no, it? that's a device. Don't do that. <laughs> I was reading a story. I don't know if you saw it in the news about Libby Trickett, of course, yeah. hero swimmer, champion. Yeah. Um, and she uh, had a an awkward encounter, I think, with a family member who said to a child of hers who is nine um, something about the fact that she seems to have dropped some weight and she's looking fantastic. And that was to the child in the house. Now, Libby thought long and hard about whether she was going to deal with this privately or she was kind of going to open the discussion publicly because of how Mm, disgusted she was. Let's have a little listen to Libby. I had someone close to us say to my eight-year-old daughter today, wow, you look like you've lost weight. Have you lost weight? You look great. My daughter's eight. Mm. And the other, she kind of continues on in, in her socials post. I guess what I, what I want to ask is, yes, there's the whole discussion around how we talk about body image and how that's projected onto particularly little little girls. But I'm guessing, and I, and I don't know who the family, family member was, but there's always a tricky family member. And sometimes the older generation thinks that the way they parent or the way that they spoke to their children is going to work for you and your children today. It doesn't always. How do you have those, you know, um, how do you kind of say to people, hey, guess what? These aren't your children to be looking after. These aren't your children to speak to that way. And we're not going to have that in our house and still be kind of okay with them. Am I making sense? No, totally. Do you know what I mean? Because I I mean, I've even, there's even books I've seen. How do you have that chat? Books for grandparents or books for aunties and uncles um, because um, sometimes it's not great for everybody to get involved and put their parenting skills into a different household. The most important conversation in that point is the conversation between Libby and her child. And so I don't think you are going to change a person who says that 
you can have a hard conversation with them if you want, but that relationship there, I, I, don't, I think they'll probably double down and say, that's true, that's how I feel, I'm just saying how I feel, yeah. um, or whatever it is. I don't think they're going to go, do you know what? I, I can't see a world in which that person goes, do you know what? No. You've made some really good points. I think I'm wrong, and I'm going to go and have a chat to this child to explain that You're what right, I said was wrong. You're right, because they do tend yeah. to say, I was just saying that they look yeah. nice. Especially if it's a family member, they're yeah, prepared to fight. Yeah, totally. And I think they will, they'll just justify what they said, or mm. they'll... They'll try and downplay the significance of it, and uh, and sort of almost sort of gaslight. Yes. Live. Well, I, I don't know this person. Maybe, they won't, but but in in general, I would say that's what's going to happen. Yeah. In let's that say situation. it's not Libby. It's just anyone. Mm-hmm. I, I would say all the emotional energy you have in that moment goes to the child, to just 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 to say to them, just to explain to them that um, what was just said was was utter nonsense in whichever language will work for you and your child, um, and what matters is how kind they are, um, how compassionate they are. Um, how much they, you know, all, all the stuff mm. that we know that kids, um, yep. n- you know, need to hear. And basically, you are enough as you are right now. You are enough, and you don't need approval from outside people. All that kind of stuff. Yeah. And so, when an adult says something like that to a child, of course, the child's going to trust the adult because they're the adult in that situation. The message there to Libby Trickett's daughter was, "You look better when you're thin." Mm. Such a dangerous and toxic Whoa. message to receive. So, um, I, I think um, I know Libby very well. We're very lucky to have her on our podcast. She's a beautiful person. She's amazing. And I know that she would have put a lot of work into that conversation. So my message. So I'm very long. Sorry, if I could no, do this in a very no, quick I way. No, yeah. The all the emotional. I like the long that. way, by the way, okay. but I know we don't usually <laughs> have time for it on the show. <laughs> <laughs> um, all the emotional energy you have in that moment needs to go towards your child. Yeah. And to sort of almost rescue that situation. Uh, but I'm sure for a lot of parents, they've done so much great work in that area that it won't be that m- much of a struggle to yeah. get them to understand it. And you can adapt then that kind of that um, way of parenting, whether it's a chat. Or, 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 sorry, you can adapt that way of parenting, um, whether it's a discussion about kind of weight or about other things Any, within the household. Absolutely. Always put your focus on the child, not the person who's saying the things you don't Completely. want them to say. Yep. yep, totally. We love you to death. We do. The sixth season of The Imperfects. Um, it starts. When is it up? When's your first episode? You? When are you kicking off? Monday. This coming Great. Monday. Episode one. With I don't think we're allowed to say who, but he, it rhymes with Hat Rummins. <laughs> wow. wow! Wow! Oh, the tennis player. Well, that is right. amazing. <laughs> um, hey, I could do a good in swinging Yorker as well, man. Just to round it out. Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, Hugh. Thanks for coming in, buddy. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Thank you. Fits in Whipper with Kate Ritchie is a Nova podcast. For more great shows like this, download the Nova Player via the App Store or Google Play. The Nova Player.